So we look to these words in the 24th chapter of Mark's gospel, beginning verse 44 through 53. This is Ascension Sunday, the day Jesus ascends to go be, be with God. He's saying farewell to his disciples. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. One day there was a man who went for a walk. Like a number of us go for a walk. He happened to live near a woods. As he walked in the woods, his eyes came upon a tree branch that had a cocoon upon it. He felt led to take out his pocket knife and uh, trim the end of the branch where the cocoon was attached. He carefully carried the branch back to his home and he placed the branch across the top of a very large glass jar so that the cocoon uh, would be protected inside the jar and yet be open to the air. He wanted to see if he could witness firsthand the miracle of nature, the metamorphosis of a caterpillar into a butterfly uh, through its season of being in the cocoon. And so a couple of weeks passed and the man noticed how the ch colors of the cocoon changed more and more to, to reveal the future colors of the butterfly inside. Then came the day where he realized the cocoon looked like it was ripe or ready to open any time. And sure enough, in the middle of the day, he noticed a crack opening in the cocoon. And it became just slightly larger. And so he sat down to watch this miracle unfold before his eyes. As he watched, he, he noticed how the butterfly inside was struggling and struggling. And it seemed to make such slow progress opening up that little aperture in, in the cocoon. And so the man took out his pocket knife again and decided he would help out a little. Just very carefully, very gently, he, he cut a little further line in the cocoon, in that opening. And sure enough, that seemed to help. And so the butterfly uh, began to push and, and to strain further and further, and that crack opened and widened. And, and then the butterfly emerged fully and came out of the cocoon. It came out at first with its wings uh, uh, wrinkled and curled up. It could not fly right away. And so the man watched the, the butterfly uh, test its wings, try and straighten them, unfurl them further, uh, get the curls and the wrinkles ironed out. The butterfly worked and worked, and, and it, it crawled around on, on top of the table. And the man began to realize that uh, the butterfly's wings were only going to open so much that curls and wrinkles still remained in them. And then the man began to wonder if something was wrong. Finally, he realized as the butterfly was not taking flight, it was not taking wing, that somehow the wings were going to stay in this, in this wrinkled and curled up condition. The butterfly would not be a flyer, it would be a walker. Then the even deeper realization sank in. The man wondered if he should have touched the cocoon at all. Should he have ever bothered to try and open that first crack wider? He, he gathered then that 
the butterfly needed, the difficulty, the struggle of pushing against the cocoon and trying to break open that crack all by itself, uh, that was part of the strengthening of the muscles that underlied the, the operation of the butterfly's wings. The man realized that by depriving the butterfly of the struggle to get out of the cocoon, the man had also deprived the butterfly of the needed exercise it needed in that critical moment to develop the strength that it needed to fly. The man realized that this was a parable for life. We often wish that our struggles would be reduced. Sometimes we wish even for miracle intervention to cut us loose and free us up from our struggles and our difficulties. And yet, as we look at this parable, uh, we realize that quite often the difficulties we have, the resistance that we face in life, it is there building the strength of our character, the strength of our muscles, the strength of our souls. This lifetime is like a cocoon. It is a metamorphosis where uh, we learn what it really means to transcend the physical difficulties of life and appreciate the spiritual blessings of life with God. Uh, these are hard times. We are straining and strengthening a lot of muscles, and we sure wish we might get a little extra help. But it needs to be the right kind of help at the right time. We also need to continue to build up and strengthen our muscles in in these hard times. They certainly help us understand the lightness of being that comes from our spiritual life. Another butterfly story that I want to share with you. It starts with my pre professor of preaching that I, that I met in seminary. Let, let me tell you a little bit about the story of Dr. Ronald Sleeth and his wife, Natalie. Uh, Dr. Sleeth felt his call to ministry at a fairly early age. So he was set up with his college work and his seminary work done, and he was already uh, moved from being a pastor to a professor of preaching at Garrett Seminary in Evanston, Illinois. That's the one up by Chicago. When he was in Evanston, he was blessed with the opportunity to meet uh, his, his wife-to-be, uh, Natalie. She was finishing up her studies in piano, she was just starting her career in ministry, uh, uh, playing piano for church, and then, of course, uh, she was invited to be a choir director for adult and children's choirs. And so both of them made a great team in ministry. He was in the preaching, she was in the music. And so their careers progressed. Uh, uh, Pastor, Pastor Ron, who'd become Professor uh, Sleeth, he went on to become college president. Uh, and so uh, their, their life seemed blessed indeed. And of course, Natalie, uh, when she couldn't find a piece of music that was just right for her church, she started writing her own songs. And before you know it, people were begging her to publish those songs, share them with more people. And so indeed, her, her songs began to catch on and they began to be sung by adult and children's choirs around the country and around the world. Natalie did so well with her music that uh, Ron Sleeth began to tell people, I'm Natalie Sleeth's husband. And he said that their marriage went from the early years when he was the celebrity as the pastor, professor, and college president to then uh, Natalie became more of a celebrity with uh, international songwriting credits and invitations to give workshops um, all over the country and the world. But then um, there came some, some health care concerns for both Ron and Natalie. In their 50s, uh, they began to feel aches and pains. They began to feel weakness and fatigue. For Ron, uh, his hands, his feet, his back, boy, they just hurt more and more. So he gave up and went to the doctor, and the doctor said, yes, you're beginning to get uh, serious arthritis 10 to 20 years early. So be careful, consider downshifting a little bit. Consider slowing down your physical activities. And so uh, 
So Professor Sleeth, he had to he had to start looking at slowing down. At the same time, Natalie, uh, she noticed that she just felt more fatigued during the day. She also began to notice a tingling in her hands and feet. So it became clear she needed to go to the doctor. After running some tests, the results showed that uh, she was in the early stages of multiple sclerosis, that she was going to need to be careful of her hands and feet and spinal column in a different way. And so both of them had to have some long talks about downshifting and making changes in their careers. Uh, Professor Sleeth in his, in his college president ministry, uh, Natalie in her music ministry. And so it was in this downshift that we had the privilege of them coming to, to Denver to Iliff School of Theology, where Ron came in as professor of preaching, not college president, and where Natalie came in as a songwriter. She did not join up to be a choir director at any of the choirs in Denver. She just concentrated on, on writing her music. It was a blessing to have them in Denver. Uh, professor Sleeth was a very popular professor of preaching. He had a great sense of humor, and he had a very nurturing way of critiquing our sermons to make us better in preaching without discouraging us. And of course, uh, Natalie Sleeth, every once in a while, she would send a song over to the seminary choir so that we could test drive her songs. Uh, our choir director was a very talented director in his own right, and so he would take notes and take them back to Natalie so that she could work on the songs and improve them. And so it was that uh, for you know three years of school, um, my life was uh, blessed by uh, this ministry that Ron and Natalie had. About uh, about a year after graduation, the word came out to those of us who graduated school in Denver that uh, Ron Sleeth had been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, he, he had been told that he had cancer of the pancreas and that indeed there were not very many things they could do. He needed to start thinking about uh, end of life questions. And so it was, uh, it, was a, it was a blow to all of us to hear this news and we lifted both Ron and Natalie up in our prayers. Also, of course, Natalie, she had to deal with the end of life questions as she was going to be the surviving uh, spouse of Professor Sleeth. One of her ways of dealing with grief was of course to turn to her music. She had had uh, some music going around in her mind. There was a melody that she had had for some time she decided now is the time to figure out the words to go with it. And so she began writing uh, lyrics to match the music. And so it was once again, there came a time for her to send that music over to the seminary choir for a test drive. That test drive turned out to be the memorial service for her husband, Dr. Ronald Sleeth. When he passed, the song, the hymn of promise, that begins, in the bulb there is a flower, in the seed and apple tree, is the memorial song that Natalie Sleeth wrote for her husband while he was dying of cancer. And so it was, after that song came out, to minister and comfort the mourners in that funeral service, uh, from that moment in 1985, that song brought comfort to many others and word of mouth spread it so quickly, you ought to get this song. That by 1989, in four short years, that song had gone from its initial debut to inclusion in our United Methodist hymnal. That is how number 707 came to be in our songbook. The reason we sang it before the sermon is uh, I think it'd be pretty hard on us to sing it after the sermon. I know I might fog up the computer screen. What I want to share with us is, again, the cocoon makes a great parable, a great symbol for our life journey. This life journey is like being in the cocoon. We have our physical limitations. It's like the shell of the cocoon. We struggle against our physical limitations our entire life long. And right now, 
I believe we can benefit from this message to remember that we're in the cocoon of this life and that we have struggles. And it is through these struggles that we build strength, we gain strength, we gain knowledge. We gain strength of body, we gain strength of character, strength of soul. This life is this cocoon, this, this in-between period, this metamorphosis, where we change from being so much physical create creatures to discovering the spiritual create creature that uh, is truly who we are. And so it is. Uh, we're in this process of emerging from our cocoons. And we think about Jesus, how in his lifetime, when he was still in his caterpillar phase as a human being, he also had his struggles, his difficulties. Not everybody liked him. In fact, we know the story. We just went through it in Holy Week. There were those people who did not like him. They resented him. And so they tried to nail him to the tree, just like someone might pin a butterfly to the board in a butterfly collection. They tried with the crucifixion to nail Jesus to the tree. They tried to nail down his wings. But we know that Jesus was able to face that struggle and overcome it. We know that Jesus went to the cross and that he was able to emerge from the cocoon on Easter morning three days later. Today is the second raising. It is Ascension Sunday. It's the Sunday when we remember Jesus rising after walking and teaching the disciples for 40 days. It's time for him to really spread out his wings and fly home to God. It is Ascension Sunday, and we see Jesus using his wings. And as we see Jesus use his wings, it reminds us to keep working, to be up to the struggle, to keep gaining the strength that we need so that we also can be released from this physical cocoon and spread our spiritual wings so that we can also fly as Jesus did. Amen.